Hello everyone uh, and a very warm welcome to uh, today's event. My name is Daniel Hahn and I'm very pleased to have been asked to chair this conversation about the new first set series of chapbooks that is just being published by uh, Stranger, Strangers Press. Um, this event is in partnership with Strangers Press with New Dutch Writing, um, which is a UK-wide campaign that's been running since last autumn to promote contemporary Dutch literature and also literary translation. Um, for those of you who don't know, Strangers Press um, is a small independent publisher in the UK who've already published two small series of chapbooks uh, over the last few years, one of contemporary writing from Japan and one from Korea. Um, and this new series, Verset, is showcasing the work of uh, eight exciting young writers working in the Netherlands today. Um, and their translators, I should say, this is very important, the translators are I have to I have to resist the temptation to make it all about the writers because as a translator I I will be I will feel like I'm you know betraying you know betraying my siblings somehow. Um, I, we're joined today. I'm very pleased to say by two of the contributing writers to the series uh, and two of the translators who translated chapbooks for the series. Um, I will introduce the four of them very briefly. We're going to have uh, a chat. We're going to hear a little bit from each of them reading their work and also talking about their work. And then, of course, there's going to be um, a live Q&A uh, after our conversation. So um, as you listen to them talk, do, of course, please be thinking about things you might want to hear from, uh, from our four speakers. Just some very quick introductions to them. I think you will have the... Um, the bios that you can read in front of you anyway, but very briefly, um, Thomas Hilma van Vos uh, has published four works of fiction, including novel and short story collection. His uh, chapbook in this series, Thank You For Being With Us, comprises two short stories, uh, which are translated by Moshe Gilula. Um, Karin uh, Amatmokrim is a Surinamese Dutch writer who is the author of six novels, as well as essays and short stories. Her work explores cosmopolitanism and notions of home and identity. And her chapbook, Reconstruction, has been translated into English by Sarah Timmer Harvey. Alice Tetley Paul uh, studied German and Dutch at the University of Sheffield and an MA in Literature Translation at UEA. Um, she's currently the translator in residence for New Dutch Writing. Uh, and for this series, she translated the work of Bregia Hofstede, who was the writer in residence at the National Centre for Writing um, in October of last year. And Josef van der Voort is a translator working from Dutch, German and French, who has an MA in translation studies from the University of Sheffield. We have good Sheffield representation here at this event. Um, he also runs the Emerging Translators Network, which is a, a network of, of early career translators in the UK and around the world. Um, and Josef has translated Something Has to Happen by uh, Marcia Wotel, uh, a collection of three short stories for uh, his chapbook in the series. Um, because these are mostly new writers to the English speaking world and will be new writers to, uh, to those of you watching and the chapbooks are very, very new now. Um, I'm going to work on the assumption that uh, we have an audience who doesn't, who hasn't read the chapbooks, who doesn't know the work. And so I'm just going to start by asking each of you just to give us a very brief, a kind of one minute introduction to the, the chapbook that you wrote or translated um, for the benefit of our audience. Just a very quick kind of what is it roughly, what's the setting, um, what, are you, what are you trying to do? with it. Uh, Thomas, will you just tell us briefly about yours first? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for the introduction. As you just stated, my chapbook consists of two stories. Um, one of the two is the longest, and that's also the title of the chapbook. I will focus on that one now. Um, that's about a father and a son, and they have a troubled past, a troubled relationship, and the son has written a book about the father. The father doesn't really know what's in it, but the book becomes a bestseller. The son becomes a TV uh, authority. Uh, and then the story uh, is around one TV program where both the father and the son are invited and are being interviewed. And we follow the father. He doesn't live in the Netherlands anymore, but he goes to Amsterdam and he feels trapped when he comes there and he feels trapped while the interview starts and he doesn't really know why and he doesn't really know if he has to blame his son or himself but 
the story is essentially about becoming someone else's story and how to react on that. And that's where the most uh, the tension comes from. Thank you very much. Um, I'll ask you in a moment to read a little extract from, from that. Um, but Karen, will you tell us a little bit, Karen, about your, yours is, a, is actually a collection of a number of different pieces all in this one chapbook, right? Yeah, I think about four or five stories even. It was kind of a challenge to me because I'm a novelist, so I didn't have too many short stories to choose from. Um, and I really wanted to have the stories that I selected to have uh, some sort of theme that would really bind them together. And um, I came out uh, on, on the notion of home, sometimes a bit more abstract, sometimes a bit more uh, concrete, um, a sense of home or a sense of belonging. and um, I actually really like the title that I didn't come up with myself, <laughs> Reconstruction, because um, I think it came from one of the stories that was about one of the high-rise buildings in a part of uh, Amsterdam and how um, this almost soulless piece of, of work actually um, houses all these souls within themselves and, and in that way becomes something of a living being itself. So I think my, my book is about home or a sense of belonging I think yeah I like the uncertainty of a writer who says I think I think <laughs> this is what my book is about this is reassuring for the rest of us I think okay, great um, <laughs> Alice what about yours tell us about the one you translated yes yeah, so I translated Bear Here by Bregio Hofstede and in it um, Bregio revisits the mountain which she used to go and visit every single year as a child so it's kind of the mountain of her youth um, and it's Sassonga in the Dolomites um, she admits it's not a particularly remarkable mountain, she says there's kind of much bigger mountains around it, but in her mind's eye, it really kind of stands head and shoulders above all of the rest of them. Um, so yeah, it's all kind of these associations from her childhood with wild animals and um, forest creatures, and she brings in various myths and legends of the region as well. Um, and yeah, you'll get a real sense for the kind of the childhood magic um, of, of the place when I, when I read the excerpts, I'm going to read a little bit later on. Um, and she says kind of over the years she's lost um, some of that kind of childhood magic has been lost but she's determined to climb the mountain again to kind of find um try and find what she's really looking for so she goes back to it first of all together with her boyfriend and then on her own and yeah it brings in all these kind of fascinating things about human impact on the planet of, on nature and on the planet and parenthood and yeah it's a really really fascinating read and i really enjoy translating it I, I, I was about to say, I could tell that you really enjoyed translating it. Um, thanks, Alice. Uh, Josef, tell us a little bit about the one you worked on. Yeah, so as you said, I translated three short stories by Marcia Vortal. Uh, two of them are actually connected. They're both narrated from the point of view of a grieving husband and wife, and they're kind of quite heartbreaking little stories, actually. And the, the third one is a sort of funny but at the same time kind of unsettling story about uh, a depressed woman who um, signs up for a therapeutic lumberjack camp and spends a week in the woods with a bunch of blokes. Um, and all three stories have this kind of spare minimalist style um, with quite simple, almost flat language, um, but there's kind of a lot of depth and ambigu ambiguity to them and uh, I think they're quite re rewarding reads for that reason. Uh, like I think I'd sort of describe uh, Marcia's style as being like Sally Rooney edited by Samuel Beckett, um, kind of quite prosaic situations but with this kind of absurdist undertone to everything, and quite unsettling at times. For anybody who's watching who thinks the idea of Sally Rooney being edited by Samuel Beckett is an absolutely monstrous thought, I should tell you the stories are brilliant and don't be frightened. I mean, I know what you mean. I completely know what you mean, but but um, but that's an alarming prospect. Anyway. <laughs> we will come back and talk about about the the, the challenges, particularly for translating that um, the the style of those stories. But I'm going to start with with Thomas and with Karen. Um, and ask you each to read a little extract, uh, and then we're going to talk about them. Uh, maybe Thomas, would you would you go first? Will you read us a little bit from? I think it's going to be the title story. Thank you for being with us. Yeah. Do you want the also a part of the Dutch version or? Only? I think it'll be great. It'll be lovely to hear a little bit if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I have it with me. Um, that's just for the for the tone in Dutch, um, and uh, I will read the beginning also of the English version. One uh, remark I have to make, the main character's name is typical Dutch, 
and not typical English. I didn't think of the translation while I was writing it. So it's experts. I don't really know how to say it in, in English, but that will uh, work out. Uh, first in Dutch, Egbert's zoon schreef een scriptie over familiedrama's. De scriptie werd een boek, het boek werd een bestseller en Egbert's zoon werd een autoriteit op het gebied van ontspoorde gezinnen. Telkens wanneer een doorgedraaide tienermoeder haar kind vergiftigt, een overspannen huisvader zijn vrouw verminkt of een zwijgzame puber zijn ouders neersteekt, mag Koen voor de camera's opdragen om in wel overwogen voor iedereen begrijpelijke zinnen uit te leggen hoe zoiets kan gebeuren. Well, I don't know if you understood anything of that, but now will come the translation that's on my screen left to the camera, so I won't look you in the eye, but... Egbert's son had written a thesis on domestic violence. The thesis became a book, the book became a bestseller, and Egbert's son became an authority on dysfunctional families. Every time a teen mom loses his and poisons her child, a stressed out house husband maims his wife or an unresponsive teenager stabs his parents, Kuhn is invited to appear on TV and explain in carefully formulated sentences that everyone can understand how such a thing could happen. Egbert never intended to become a father. Children slobber and whine and demand constant attention. Marika thought so too. So they took precautions. Condoms, the pill. Their doctor said, chances of pregnancy in such cases are less than 0.1%. Egbert still remembers the cold spring day when Marika and he heard those words. He insisted they go see the doctor just to be on the safe side. He remembers leaving the surgery in Amsterdam West, straightening his collar and thinking, why didn't he just round it off to 0%? It's such a negligible difference. Now he knows. Kuhn, his son, is living proof that less than 0.1% isn't the same as zero. I will stop right here. This is the first part of the story. Thank you, Thomas. That's great. Um, I, I had a couple of things I'm going to ask you about, and, and we'll move on to Karen in a moment. The first other thing I wanted to ask you about is, is, is tone. I, I obviously only have access to this through the translation, and so I'm guessing that the translation is, is, is conveying the tone of the original. And there's something that I thought really interesting about the fact that this is, so this is a sad story, this is a story about a sad life in a way a sad situation a relationship but it's very emotionally contained there's a bit of humor which is quite subtle which is sort of tonal humor rather than you know situational humor mm -hmm. and i wonder if you can say something about the the process of finding that right tone i mean i suppose that this is kind of a question about process about whether you edit and edit and edit but it feels incredibly precise to me well thanks uh first and foremost um and that's, uh, that, that's, that's rather a good question or remark, because that was something um, that was a, something I really had to search for while writing this story, this story in particular, because, uh, well, it's about a father and a son, like I just stated. And at first it was a first uh, hand, so an I person story about the son, but that became too complaining, a son complaining about his father, and then there wasn't really the focus of a cheap feed program. I switched it in a third person story, and then after I think half a year, I put the story away, I picked it up, and then I thought, no, I have to, I have to come closer to the father, who in, 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 in the version of the son was really a, a distant, not really emotionally connected father, just an absent father, but he was kind of a cliche. Uh, I th I th and then I thought, it's much more interesting if I go into the emotionally absent father. So I wanted to have someone who is distant. Uh, that's not just the son's version. He is kind of distant. Uh, and I want to show how he reacts if he's confronted by his past, if he's confronted by direct questions in a, in a really tense situation, a TV program that's not something that you can walk away from. And therefore I wanted the tone to be calm I wanted to be well, yeah, precise, not about 
uh, big emotional statements, not about um, a long flow of thoughts, but I wanted someone who's losing control. That's, that's what the story is actually about for me. So uh, the tone was really important for me uh, because not just, it's not just about style, but it's also about the main theme of the story, I think. I'm really interested that you said that the perspective shifted as you wrote it, because one of the things that seems to me is really interesting about it is the extent to which this main, this character, the father, is aware of how he looks to other people. Yeah. Even very early on, he sees his reflection somewhere. I think it's in a shop window or something, and he imagines, he tries to imagine what he will look like to people when he appears on TV. And a lot of this, this is, this is uncommon with one of Karen's stories as well, actually. A lot of it seems to be about um, the extent to which we can see the insides and the outsides of people, what is revealed. Um, and in a way, it feels like this is the thing that, this is the thing, the, the thing that fiction does better than anything else. It shows us, it gives us a way of seeing inside this character who has a very clear kind of shell, a very clear kind of presentation to the world. Yeah, and he's constantly reflecting indeed on how will I look, how will I be seen, uh, what will people perceive when I suddenly am back in Amsterdam. And that's, that's the constant tension, not only between him, him and his son, but also between how he looks on himself how he looks on his past and how he sees himself suddenly confronted in a window in tv cameras and all that kind of stuff so that was the reason it wasn't just a a, a minor swift in perspective but that was the reason that i really needed the third person the third person perspective there's another thing which which i mean it's always tempting when you're when you're doing when you're kind of chairing these conversations to try and make connections between the pieces of writing uh, and we're going to hear from Karen in a moment but, but when I was trying to think of the things that they have in common or things that are different I was struck by a line Thomas in which uh, in which Kuhn says when he's talking about th this book the, the book about his, his relationship with his father he says something like um, the book is a this book is a personal story but it's also a reflection of our times and I wondered whether that's also something you feel is a claim uh, you, you might make about this story, whether there are certain things, for example, the fact that, you know, a, a private story becomes owned by the public, mm -hmm. whether there is something about the story which is, uh, which is not just the story of a person or two people, but is something that is about our, our moment somehow. Yeah, well... Um... Yeah, t two things about this. Uh, I know the part of the dialogue, uh, and I really wanted to put that part in because, uh, indeed, it's something that private problems via fiction suddenly become uh, problems that everybody talks about or that everybody can talk about that are in a bookshelf and stuff. I really wanted to focus on that via a story uh, because, yes, that's, that's true what he says. Um, when someone writes about their personal problems won't just be personal it will, will become problems in the outside world um, and the other thing is that that I also really uh, want to like not, not really criticize um, the focus on private problems of authors but I wanted to uh, make it that also a team that there are a lot of TV programs, I don't know how that's in England, but in the Netherlands, that only will invite an author if he's willing to talk about, well, his disease, his parents, and that kind of stuff. And I also want to not ridiculize or ironize, but I wanted to also uh, make that a team. So yeah, th there were a lot of reasons that I really wanted to explicitly put that in the story. Thank you very much. Uh, I might come back to some of that a little later if we have time. Karen, would you read us a little bit from, from uh, one of your stories? I think yeah. from Jack Dorr, you're going to read. Jack Dorr, I'll, I'll start with um, the Dutch. Just the first sentences in the Dutch story. Er zijn dingen die je niet kan weten, die moeten je verteld worden. Zoals dat het in de straat van de bakkers heerlijk naar vers brood in koekjes ruikt, maar dat de geurigste plek van het kamp toch in het oosten is. Daar zijn de wasserijen en de kleermakers en er hangen stoomwolken die naar bloemen en zeep ruiken. Ik ga er elke dag heen om te zien hoe de mannen strakke banden van doorzichtig plastic over de schone was spannen en ze op wagentjes laden. Als de wagens vol zijn, worden ze door een poort in de muur geduwd en verdwijnen ze naar de andere kant. 
De mannen keerden terug naar hun winkeltjes en dan blijft er één jongen achter. Hij is niet één van ons. Hij bewaakt de poort tegen mensen zoals wij. En dat, doet hij, en, en dat doet hij terwijl hij er stijf bij staat in zijn zware laarzen en een groot kogelvrij vest met het witte embleem van de vogel. Hij heet Klaas Jan, maar ik noem hem Kaas Jan, omdat namen de gewoonte hebben zich te voegen naar wie ze draagt en niet andersom, zoals sommige mensen denken. I can't imagine how this sounds to the British. <laughs> With all the... <laughs> um, do you want me to... Read something from the English uh, translation already? Yes, please. Are you wondering why I'm golden? I said. I've learned that when it comes to my odd appearance, it's better not to beat around. He didn't react, so I told him I was born this way, but kept quiet about how my father told me I was made of gold because my destiny is to save our people. I said nothing of this because the safe people are afraid of progress and change. My name is Kiss Kiss, I said. Because you're made of gold, he asked, and I knew then that we would be friends. He was clever. I love clever people. Klaus Jan doesn't talk much. This makes him a good listener. I don't think there are many stories where he comes from. Here, there are more than enough. Some are horrifying, but I don't tell, tell him these. The second story I told him was about how, how I once was named Shaq. My father loved the man with that name, so he named me after him. The other Jacques sang in French. Sometimes my father sang along. It never sounded very good, to be honest. Also, I have golden skin. Not literally 24 karat, before you get any ideas about cutting off one of my ears and pawning it, but I look like I'm made of gold. I blush and get all warm when I'm in the light and my skin glistens like something precious. It's strange, I know. People here in the camp used to call me Jacques Dor. The children at the camp school adopted it too, but couldn't pronounce it. So they said, j'adore instead, which means something like, I love you. It didn't take long before they began just making kissing sounds at me. And since everyone likes gold, it seemed like a good name, even though it isn't really a name, more of a sound like kiss, kiss, moi, moi. I've learned since that everyone kisses differently, judging from the sounds they make when they imitate it. Sometimes I'm walking in the streets and I hear smack, smack, how are you? Or chip, chip, say hi to your sister. Sometimes there's sounds I can't even copy, let alone write down. Sounds without vowels, sounds that require facial expression. You'll have to imagine for yourself. In any case, I was once called Jack, though, ev though everyone has long forgotten that name. And I was born with a golden skin in a camp I cannot leave. And then my mother died. Some people say, She died from the shock of giving birth to a golden child, but my father vehemently denies this. She was already very weak while pregnant, but apparently she heaved her last sigh when they put me on her breast and it sounded like a yawn. And my father said it was because she was tired, so tired. I didn't tell Klaas Jan about my sister or about my mother, it didn't seem a good idea. But I did tell him the rest of the stories and he said, you're not made of gold, little boy. At best, you're a little yellow. I thought about this for a long time. I concluded he would rather think me, think of me as a lie than think of himself as living one. Some lies, as Klaas Jan would say, are safer than others. Thank you very much. It's, it's weird doing these Zoom things because I feel there should be, there should be clapping at this point. <laughs> if, imagine, <laughs> imagine there is clapping after each of your readings. We have, we can... Yeah, we have to just use your imagination a bit. Um, thank you for that, Karen. I, I have a, a few things I want to ask you about that, um, about that extract, but also about the, the story and the, and the collection of stories generally. I, I was struck by something. When, when I asked Thomas that question about a story being, um, about his story being somehow of this moment and being very much about now, one of the things he said was something like, and uh, forgive me if I don't get this quite right, Thomas, but it was something like, um, telling a private story makes it possible to, for it to be talked about. You start with something which is private and then it, you, you are able to talk about it and the things in it because it becomes a story. And I wonder if there's something in that, in, in the thing that makes you want to write, whether writing is the thing that allows you, or writing fiction particularly, is the thing that allows you to, to talk about the things that you want to talk about, to ask the questions you want to ask to get other people to talk about the things that you want them to talk about. Well, actually, for me, I think it's, it's a Mm, well, it touches on this. I think for me, uh, writing is, is not a way of 
being able to talk about certain things. It's more of um, researching or, you know, I, I have a lot of questions um, and I wonder how does the world work? Um, and I think that writing for me was al always has always been a way of trying at least to answer these questions. So uh, this story in particular, um, I wrote this um, when Donald Trump was elected president in the United States. And we all know that we live in very challenging times. Um, and it's not only in, in the US, but also in, in the entire Western world, I think, um, where um, people tend to think that they are very realistic when they talk about problems um, and the way they talk about certain groups. And it worries me, obviously, as a migrant, but also um, I think the narrative is very dangerous. Um, and I, I can feel very, um, uh, what's the word, powerless as a person, but also as a writer, because what do you have? You only have your imagination. And so for me, this, this type of story, that this story about, about Jacques Dor is just this very tiny little way of, 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 of showing uh, what's at stake, basically. Is that, a, is that an answer to your question at all? <laughs> it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's much better than the question, actually. Um, thank you, it's a very good answer. One of the things that it makes me wonder about is, is then what you're doing is you create a character um, in this, in a situation, a very particular, very difficult situation, and you're making choices about how this person responds, how this person reacts. And I was wondering about, um, I guess, the idea of a character who, who chooses to resist or chooses not to resist that situation. Again, this relates a bit to Thomas's story. Um, because Kiss Kiss, he, uh, he's not a, this is not a kind of complaining sort of character. Mm -hmm. And there is sort of, there is resistance. He, uh, Kiss Kiss has a sister who, 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 wants to, who wants to resist much more than Kiss Kiss does. But I wonder whether Kiss Kiss's own way of being in this place, smiling, waving, making friends, being optimistic about things, whether one of the things that that shows us, that's also a kind of resistance that we see. Uh, maybe, but um, in any way, in any case, it's, it's never um, my idea to judge what stance one, you take. I think this story in particular is about how we find refuge in, in telling stories. Um, so this whole idea of him being a golden boy, of him being like this hope for his people, is, is very ridiculous, of course. Um, but maybe this is, this is, was, in hindsight, was my way of, of maybe comforting myself in a way, saying, okay, so we, we do find refuge in, in story um, because they can give us hope, even if in the end, um, they won't, they won't rescue us at all, these stories. <laughs> Um, but still, the stories, when we tell them to each other, it's, it's a way of living, right? It's just a way of breathing, I guess. So I think this story isn't really about showing what, what particular position you can take within the world or in the field, but more the power of, of story, actually. Because a lot, that there's something about... about the meaning that stories give, but also the structure. Some of, some of, some of uh, this story is structured in terms of the, the, the second story I told him was, the third story I told him was. And so it's framed as these kind of contained units that are, that are reasonably meaningful and reasonably safe somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it also shows, I think, um, how important it is ex exactly what we tell each other. Because if you leave part of the information out, it immediately colors the rest of the information that you do give. Um, and also for me, it was like a way of playing with, 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 the, with, the, with the story. Just, okay, so this little boy, this kiss kiss, he thinks about it. Okay, what can I tell my new friend? My new friend is the guard of the camp that keeps me prison. Um, what stories can I tell him and what stories can't I tell him? It was actually a very fun story to write, even though it's such a very heavy topic. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask something slightly, this might sound like a slightly strange question. I was struck reading um, all the different stories in this chapbook, and it's clear that they have certain things in common. Thematically, they have certain things in common. Um, but they're also very different in tonally, they're quite different in setting, they're quite different in the way the stories are told. And I'm always curious, um, and I, I ask this question as someone who does not write fiction, whether this sort of variety 
in the way you tell a story, whether the variety is partly for you, whether partly it's a way of trying things, not being bored, try a different thing. It's obviously, it's effective for a reader, but I wonder how much it's also oh, it's very good. to try things. Yeah, that's a very good question. For me, it's, um, so I, I always start with a question in my head, um, something that I want to explore actually. And then um, I find a character. And then when I find a character that can really carry the, the, the story for me, I try, um a different voices and then i choose the one that fits him best in my opinion and i've heard this comment before um saying that all my books are quite different from each other um, and one one uh, journalist said and i was really struck because it was so accurate and that uh, what really binds my work together is that it's always about people who are just just outside of the group looking in and I think that's really the only thing, but the style definitely, I think uh, sometimes like the, the story with uh, with Thomas, when he said some stories really need some, some type of humor in it and some stories really don't. And um, it it's really, really depends on, on the characters, I think, for me, yeah. I don't know how it is for, for Thomas, but. Thomas, what about you? Do, do you? do you see a kind of, are these things in common across your writing? Uh, yeah, and, and indeed, it's a it's a good question because it's uh, it's it's something I also think about when I look in hindsight to the stories and books I've written, uh, and and what binds them and what makes them different and that, that kind of questions. Uh, but when I'm comparing it to Karin and not just what she just said, but also the the books I've read uh, that that she wrote, um, is that my stories and books I think they are more thematically linked and the main characters well they aren't obviously not always the same uh not at all but they could be well distant relatives i think and there are some themes um for example how do you look to yourself like we just talked about uh, about the, regarding my story uh that are themes that that always s s slip uh, in my story, sometimes uh, dominantly, sometimes in the background. But I think there are um, some main themes, also family, which is also uh, a big theme in the story I just read a, an expert from, uh, that always come back. And of course, I try to variate in style and in, in, in main character and in perspective, but I don't want to, well, you have some authors that, that want to like break free every new book and do a completely different thing. I'm not one of those authors. Mm -hmm. I try to work uh, further and I hope hopefully deeper and, and better, <laughs> but on the same yeah, playground, the same field. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to listen to uh, Joseph and Alice now reading, um, talking about writers who, who like to do something different with every book stylistically or thematically. This is obviously the translator's job. Um, so let's hear just a quick reading from, from each of our translators and, and I'm going to ask them a bit about their experiences with these, uh, with their translations. Alice, do you want to go first? Yeah. Imagine you're five, six, maybe 10. A homemade calendar has been up on the living room, room wall for months, counting down the days. Every night before you go to bed, you or one of your sisters gets to cross off a box. It's a Dutch winter, dark, wet, grey, cold, chapped faces, taut mouths, busy parents, cabin fever. You know that once all the boxes have been crossed off, you'll get on a train that will transport you to a dazzling week. Sun on glistening snow, hot chocolate with whipped cream in toasty mountain huts. Then, by the time you return home, there'll be crocuses in the garden. You leave on Friday straight after school. The first leg of the journey isn't particularly exciting. You simply walk to the station and take the local train to Arnhem. Grandad's there, waiting. He'll bear the title, the Duke of Salis, for the duration of this trip, because he's paying for everything, and because, to keep out the bright Italian sunlight, he's attached black leather flaps to the arms of his Salis flappers. Thanks to the Duke of Salis and to your outfits, which clash with those of the other passengers, this part of the journey is the most exotic. You and your sisters wait on the platform in Arnhem in snow boots, hats and ski pants, mittens dangling from your sleeves as a triumphant wave goodbye to the ordinary. 
farewell boring things, hello mountaintop. Iron on patches from previous trips announce your destination. Refugio Porcel, 2,065 metres. Lagazoi, 2,753 metres. Scuola di Ski Col Bosco. My dad still has these on his winter coat, which has since faded from navy to light grey. You have to change trains a few times, chasing each other up and down the cold platforms, sliding down the handrails, eating an apparently endless supply of currant buns, tangerines and scrub carrots from a brown paper bag to save off fatigue. At night you get to sleep in the top bunk in the sleeper train. The carriage is a kind of swaying living room in which stuff can topple over at any time. There's a net between the beds and you do your very best to accidentally roll into the groaning nylon. If you're lucky, you see the dark silhouettes of hills or mountains when you wake in the night. You're thrilled to find patches of dirty snow alongside the railway lines, which you imagine is the trail of a giant wild animal you're tracking to its lair high in the mountains. The Duke of Salis is snoring, but stops whenever one of you touches his nose. When you need the loo, you sway down the aisle on your own, passing a man who stumbles, first into one wall, then the other, before stroking the crown of your head and saying something in a foreign language. In the small toilet cubicle, he's left behind a smell of beer and urine and secrets. Thank you very much. Uh, Josef, let's hear from you and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the translation. Ben is driving over the speed limit. It doesn't bother anybody at this time of day. The roads are quiet. The great exodus hasn't started. Most people are still eating breakfast, reading the paper or lying in bed, gliding their fingers over their phones or their lovers. A kettle whistles, chocolate sprinkles tumble onto the kitchen tiles. A knife glides through the butter. The coffee's run out. Curtains slide open or stay closed. Computers start up, alarm clocks go off, fitness fanatics and people with resolutions run through the park, apples are peeled, packets of muesli emptied into bowls, tyres pumped up, citrus fruits squeezed, dogs let out, chickens fed, doctor's appointments attended, day after day. So many people get up day after day, at the same time, together, and yet alone, always alone. Ben has come to hate it this part of the day. He wants to get it over with as soon as possible, to give it the slip. It's a chore he has to get through, something he too can't escape. The morning will always be there, and that's exactly the problem with the morning. It's like he can't breathe, like the morning is squatting on top of him, fat and insistent, saying, I'll always be here, come what may. The others won't be at the dock when he gets there. Nobody will be waiting for him. But these days he likes it that way. Sometimes he arrives just early enough to see a man mopping the floor of the harbour master's office. Those people work overnight, so no one is bothered by them, so everyone can believe they keep the office clean by themselves. A world without a blemish. Ben puts his foot down on the accelerator. They're used to it, he thinks. We've all got used to it, to the morning, to each other, to this life. The car races along the canal. It's one long straight road to the village, which starts with the petrol station, followed by the roundabout, the business park, the houses, the centre, and then the exact same monotonous landscape again, the canal with empty pasture on either side. Some days he's here even earlier at dawn. He sees hunters crossing the pasture in the twilight, always in groups of three. They walk over the field with long strides, awkward and ungainly. They've already shot their quarry. The animals dangle from their necks like garlands. He's never eaten hare before, though he has eaten rabbit. It tasted good, if not quite how he expected. What he's realising more and more often is he's better off expecting nothing. That works sometimes, but not if you know what you're looking for, like the hunters. They know what they're looking for because they know what to expect, because they know what they got out of bed for. That one moment, the sight of the hare, and then the repetition of that one moment. Maybe that's what life is, Ben thinks. One moment, the repetition of that one moment. Thank you very much. You, you said, Joseph, when you were introducing the, the, the story at the very beginning of our conversation, you talked about that, that, that really spare prose, that really clear kind of very, very sharp prose. I wonder if that caused problems, whether that was a challenge to try. I mean, every, every translation has its own challenges, but I wonder whether that's one of the things that was difficult about this, is, is managing that kind of restraint and resisting the temptation to, to kind of fill it out somehow. Absolutely, yeah. That was probably the because um, this translation was, along with all the translations, was uh, was a mentorship. So I was working with a more experienced translator. In my case, that was David Doherty, 
And that was kind of the main focus of our conversations, really, because my initial reading the story was, oh, this is all very simple language and it's going to be straightforward, it's going to be a dull this, this will be fine. And then when you get into it, it's, uh, it's really not, because you've got to stay so faithful to just the, the sort of stripped back quality of that prose and also the fact that uh, Marcia Vortel uses so much ambiguity in her writing. So uh, I was probably being picked up well in places where I decided I decided what this passage obviously meant. And, you know, David would point out, actually, she's not specifically said that. It's quite an ambiguous phrase that she's using there. You need to find a suitably ambiguous way of rendering it in English. Um, and then forever, I'd come up with a sort of flourish that I thought worked quite well. And David would say, no, this person would never say that. This is this is far too literary. You know, this is a very flat style. You need to, to rethink that. So. No flourishes. Strictly no flourishes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because they stand out a mile. Um, things like that. And he was absolutely right. So, yeah. And was the was the author involved in this? Did, were you one of those translators who, because I, I'm, I'm always asking questions and causing problems and I'm incredibly needy of my authors. Did you did you demand a lot of attention from your author? Um, I had a few questions and they went unanswered. And um, yeah, I had zero contact with Marcia in this translation, which um, I mean I can't comment on what her schedule was or anything like that, but I. Kind of, it kind of feels in keeping with her style and approach to things. It's almost, I feel like she just wanted to see what I thought of it, um, what I came up with. I didn't want to steer me anyway, because that's her whole, if you, you know, if you read these books, that's her whole kind of modus operandi. It's, it's just to leave room for interpretations. And that came out so often between me, the mentor, the editor, we all kind of made suggestions or, or made choices where um, it's suddenly apparent that you've read something into it that actually isn't quite there, but could be there, but mm. it could also be alongside several other things. And I think that's what makes these stories so interesting. Yeah. And so you had, you had plenty of contact um, with your author because she was around, um, but Aggie was, was in Norwich, as we said, for, for, for a bit of last autumn. Um, did, did having an author around make it, make the difficult things easier? I mean, did you, did, were you able to do things because you had access to her? I think it was really beneficial for me to be able to, I mean, I had already met Reiki before a few years ago, but to be able to spend more time with her and get to know her, especially because um, the chapbook that I was translating is very much based on her real experiences. So she could tell me a bit more about them. She also told me how it came about originally. So she, it's part of a, another series of um, books about people about um, authors going on walks and they're meant to be kind of ones that you can put in your pocket and take along with you on on a walk and she told me about all about how it, how it came about and also about a bit but more about her relationship with her boyfriend which is interesting because that he come, he pops up in the story a few times um and yeah it was really helpful so kind of to get a general idea of her but also if i had specific questions i could ask her um, for a bit more detail and she could really paint a clear picture that was very really useful and what were the uh, things that were, that were particularly difficult about this? What were the, what were the problems that, that, were, that were particular to this text? Yeah, well, mentioning the boyfriend, um, um, if you read it, you'll see it, it throughout the text, he's, he's referred to as the boy, simply. In, in the Dutch, it was de Jonge, which was a big um, problem translating that into English, really, because at first we thought the boy maybe isn't the best solution because people might imagine it to be a kind of a young boy or her, her own child. but yeah, kind of back, backwards and forth with my mentor, Jonathan Reader, who's been absolutely excellent throughout this whole process. And in the end, we decided we would just stick with the boy. We thought the context kind of made it clear and we, we decided to go with that in the end. The title is another, um, yeah, another one of those things where we thought about it, thought of potential other options. And then in the end, we decided we'll just stick with, stick with the Dutch, Berkia. So um, for any non-Dutch speakers around it, Kind of well, Berg is mountain, and Berg, the year is the diminutive, so little mountain. Um, and yeah, I'm sure the more astute reader will notice the um, play on words um, with, with her own name, so Brekia, Berkia. And this is explained relatively early on in the text itself. So we decided we'd just leave it there, especially with the picture of the mountain behind as well. Um, yeah, we had to um, add a few, add like add a few words in around where it is explained, just to make it clear to English speakers what happened. Yeah, <laughs> we got there in the end. But no, it's really useful to have Jonathan to kind of throw ideas backwards and forwards. And um, yeah, he really helped kind of tidy up the whole translation as well. It's a really interesting process. And it came, it, it came out something really beautiful, I think. Um, I, I'm curious just briefly, but I, either 
Karen or Thomas, um, what your experiences were of being translated for this, I, either whether whether you had contact with the translators or, or just what it feels like, you know, you both have, have brilliant English, obviously, but reading this work, which is um, which is yours and not yours, what your what your what your relationship is to this thing, Thomas? What's how, how was your your translation experience this time? Um, well, uh, I didn't have any contact with the translator, so um, I, I read it. I think just a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month, and that's just like you said. It's really strange because you recognize obviously the story, all the words, uh, but I didn't work on this text, and the story is five years old not that old but it's like a it's 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 like a memory that suddenly comes in your mind again or a dream that you suddenly remember again and that, that there's a really strange like it's both very intimate and very distant uh and besides that it's uh it's something that i really uh well i i, re I really love the fact that a story is translated in english uh this is my first uh, piece of work that's ever been translated in English. Only something uh, have been, uh, one book has been translated in German before, but that's like family of the Dutch language. Uh, but English, that's of course the, the language that I always hear when I listen to music, that I always see when I watch films, that I read a lot of books in. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, well, I wouldn't say cool, uh, but it's 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 an honor, and I, I I really love the fact that I could read my own text in English. It's it's really it was well, I wouldn't say overwhelming, but it was almost overwhelming. Uh, I loved I loved it. Cool, cool sounds good to me. I'm I'm <laughs> fine with cool. Well, so we can, cute. <laughs> Karen, Karen, what about, finally, what about you? What was your what was your experience of this? Uh, I had a really good experience. Oh, before I, I talk about that, I have to say, um, Alice, the crocus uh, crocuses. So like so like in Dutch the, the flowers right so crocus and I never knew is it a British is it an English word crocuses, crocuses. Oh. yeah crocuses yeah. <laughs> I love that and also uh, Joseph I I I know Marty Wortel's work a little bit and I I really I'm I'm kind of struck by how well you you managed to find the rhythm um, that's so very Marty Wortel in, uh, in what she just read that's really good. Um, yeah, I, my translator is Sara, Sara, Sara Timmer Harvey, and she was based in New York, and we did have, uh, we were in contact, and I'm, I'm sad that I didn't meet her in person, because she sounded like a real nice person. It was weird, because um, sometimes, I think that's what Thomas referred to as well, is that the English language for us has some sort of connotation because we do listen to a lot of English music, American music, and obviously the movies. Um, so you think you know you know the language quite well, but then you see your own story in this other in this language, and it feels a bit off. Um, I think Sarah really managed to actually um, really keep the soul of the stories. Um, even when um, sometimes, like with Cas Jan, uh, 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 a name like that, which is a reference to cheese and a very Dutch name like Klaas Jan, um, she really did a very good job there. Um, so yeah, I, I loved it actually. It was really nice. Great. That is that is the the answer every translator wants to hear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just one, I'm going to ask you what, all one last very quick thing before we, we um, stop for the Q&A, which is just something which uh, I do always feel like these, these events where you're kind of introducing new work and new writers to a, to a new audience. Um, I feel we should always uh, incline towards um, sharing the attention as widely as we can and being as, as generous as we can with the attention. And so I'm just going to ask you each if you can just give us the name of um, or a line about uh, another writer we should know about. Another writer, maybe working in the Netherlands, they could be someone in this series or someone who's not in the series. Um, but I wonder if you could you could share a, a particular writer that you're a kind of contemporary youngish writer that you're excited about that we should all we should all know about. 
I, I was going to say Hafid Bouassa, but he's not, not very young. <laughs> because I was, I'm very curious to see, maybe he's already been translated, I, I don't know, but he, I'm very curious to see the way he, he works with the Dutch language. It's so beautiful and so unique to see how someone would translate that to English. But a young Dutch writer, then I would say um, uh, Rashid Novaira would be an amazing uh, writer to translate, most definitely. One of the most interesting writers in, in, in the Dutch literature, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, what about you? Um, well, uh, the first name that came to mind, and that's the name I'm going to share, is uh, a writer, Lisa Spit, who's uh, really famous in, uh, she's Belgian, but also in the Netherlands. And I know uh, that her debut, de debut novel that was published in the Netherlands, I think four years ago, will be published uh, in English anytime soon. That was called Had Smelt, It Melts. I, I'm not sure if that's also the English title, but that was, apart from the success, that was a really good, um, thorough, um, well-written, uh, Dense and dense debut novel that was really a hit here, and that was really uh, that really blew me away when I read it first. And I think that will be published anytime soon in English. So yeah, I would recommend that. Lisa Spit. Thank you very much. Translators, do you have either user for Alice? Do you have a, a favorite, a thing you really wanted? If you could choose anything, what what should we know about? Joseph, what about you? Uh, yeah, I've recently read uh, Welcome in the Dreik der Sieke by Hannah Barefoot. Uh, it translates as Welcome to the Kingdom of the, Kingdom of the Sick. And it's just, it just kind of blew me away. It's this really wildly imaginative allegorical story about um, chronic illness, which is something the author has uh, plenty of experience with in their own life. But it's, uh, that makes it sound kind of uh, a bit worthy perhaps but it's just wildly inventive and imaginative and uh, kind of experimental but in all the good ways i think that should be translated brilliant thank you and alice do you have a tip from you um yes yeah, so i was in amsterdam um at the very beginning of this year and while i was there i met up with an author who lives in rotterdam called daphne howarsden and she's um just written her or almost finished writing her third novel so she was telling me all about that and I think that sounded really exciting so that should be due out imminently so I'd, I'd love to translate that well I haven't read it yet I'd love to read that and then yeah hopefully translate that as well. Brilliant um, so we've come to the end of this this bit of the conversation thank you again to Thomas and Karen and Joseph and Alice um, a reminder to people watching that you can of course order these chapbooks from the Strangers Press website I encourage you to do that um, and now we're going to go into the uh, live Q&A if anyone has any questions for our speakers. Well, I'm still here with our two writers and our two translators. I hope um, those of you who've been listening to the conversation have enjoyed it. Um, as you will have gathered in these last 15 seconds, we have all rapidly changed clothes, aged very slightly. Some of us are a little bit more disheveled than we were. Um, we're now at the, the, the final bit, the live part of this event with the live Q&A. The only thing I was going to say before we look at the, the questions that you've been sending in is one of the things that has happened in the few days since we started uh, recording that conversation um, is I have now received these very lovely things. Um, so I now have I now have visual aids to demonstrate how beautiful this collection of chapbooks is that we've been talking about. It's lovely to have the real things in my hand. Um, thank you, the four of you, again, for that really interesting conversation. Um, we have a number of comments uh, in the chat. There was a huge amount of just kind of general enthusiasm before anyone got the nerve to ask, ask questions. There were lots of, there was clapping and there was, there were lots of hearts and there was general sharing of love on this chat thing. Um, but we have a few things, uh, a few specific questions. Uh, and one of them I'd like to start with is, um, is from Kate, and you know, um, about the, the residency programs that are part of the first set um, uh, program, the Rosette campaign. Um, 
Alice uh, is the translator in residence as part of the Dutch, the new Dutch writing campaign. Thomas is going to be the first set uh, virtual writer in residence in Norwich. Um, and Kay wanted to know a little bit about um, your, your thoughts about those residencies and those experiences. Alice, let's, uh, since you started first, tell us about your, your thoughts about that residency you're doing. Well, it's been an absolutely fantastic residency so far, and it's been really varied, so there's different, different strands of it. So it's all part of the New Dutch Writing Campaign, um, and it's kind of run also through um, modern culture. So Rachel Tugut and Martin Colville for kind of organising that. Um, so one strand of it has been kind of going into schools, which is something I've never done before, and leading translation workshops for children. So I managed to, before just before lockdown happened, I managed to go into a school and lead a picture book translation workshop. Um, for children using a Dutch picture book, which, yeah, great experience, something completely different. Um, also, another strand has been going into university. So I've kind of worked along alongside Jonathan um, as part of the University of Sheffield online translation project as well. So we worked together for that. And then the chat book was another strand of it. So yeah, there's all these, all these different parts of it. And for the whole campaign, I've got Jonathan Reader, who's mentoring me. So it's been fantastic to get his experience as well and learn lots of different skills whilst also kind of sharing my knowledge and the enthusiasm for Dutch literature in, in translation. Thank you. Thomas, you haven't started yours yet. You're going to be the, the first set of virtual, I don't know what this means. You have to tell me what this means. What are the virtual writer in residence going to do? Well, that's um, that's not entirely clear yet. It will start at the 1st of October, I think. And of course, it's unfortunate that I can't just go to Norwich. Um, but just like Alice said, for me, would also uh, it's a reason for me to, to apply to it and to, to do it uh, is uh, an amount of reasons. Uh, I know the city of Norwich. I, I, I went there twice when I was a child. Um, it's not really a change of scenery, but it's it's always good to um, meet new people, hear new voices, uh, even though if it's via screen to meet new places. And it's also a good way, well, to this chapbook, it's new, it's exciting to make that story a little bit alive. But technically what I will do, I probably will have a lot of Zoom sessions also with some students or uh, teenagers, I think. I will write uh, an introduction of the story. I will write, but that's not really uh, clear how I will do that, but uh, a tour around Norwich, even though I can't be there. Um, I think I will Zoom a lot. <laughs> and even though I don't really, uh, I'm not really in love with Zoom, the medium, I really look forward to, well, to come as close as a residency as is possible nowadays. Well, I'm glad we've given you a small Zoom workout for this event. <laughs> so you'll you'll up, find yeah. your, Zoom, your Zoom legs for this in this event. Um, there's a question for the two writers about about the short story and the novel forms and whether the short stories always start as short stories. Karen, let me ask you this first, because at the beginning of the event, you said, well, I haven't written, I'm mostly a novelist. I haven't written very many short stories. It's quite hard to choose a few short stories. Do you always know when you start? Is, has the form always been decided before you start? Well, to be honest, I always write novels. So <laughs> the short stories that I've written um, were always um, asked for, you know, commissioned. Um, and I think the most interesting for me to see, um, to, to, to realize that I am first and foremost a novelist is um, that I've written a short story once uh, um, and it turned out two years later into a book. But when I go back to the, to the, to the short story, I see like this, this very small and I think a very uh, important part of the book. Uh, in that short story. So it's kind of an, an exercise, if you will. Um, but I think I have too much of a, a respect for, uh, for, a short, for a good short story and, and good short story writers um, to be just one of those writers who do both, or maybe I just can do both equally good. <laughs> it's probably the case. What about you, Thomas? Do you, do you always, when you start, do you always know what it's going to be? Yeah, most of the time, I do, 
and uh, well, I stick to the script. So when I start a short story, it uh, it never turned out like it did with Karen uh, to uh, to a whole novel. But there's always um, a tight connection between my stories and my novels. For example, the longest story of the two in my chapbook, the one I just uh, read a, a piece, uh, the first page from. Um, that's uh, the build up to a TV station uh, interview and a, a scene that's really like family of, of that scene, also a public interview is included in my last novel. And I'm quite sure that I wouldn't have written that without this story. So the story, uh, state the story, different characters, different uh, tension, but um, yeah, it's, they're always uh, connected. And when I start, I always know, uh, I know the length. So then I know if it's gonna be a short story or a whole novel. And I, I, I really like uh, also, uh, in addition to what I just said, I really like to, uh, I really like the variation between both. Um, yeah, so I try to do both. I, I'm not sure if I'm equally good at both, but I try to do both as good as I can. Thank you. There's a question about the translators and the, those mentorship experiences. I wonder whether, Josef, you might answer this. You mentioned in our conversation that you worked with David, um, with David Doherty when you were working on, on the third story. Um, and th there's a question about, I suppose, those experiences with the mentors. And if you can say something about what you gained from, from working with a kind of more experienced translator like that. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so first off, as well as changing my outfit, I've also developed a stinking cold, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, it was really great working with David, uh, and I think the main benefit was just having someone to really knuckle down the text with and go through it in great detail and back, ideas back and forth with. Um, but also, well, I, we, we brought different things to the text, and I was talking about how the short stories hinge on ambiguity, really, very productive use of ambiguity. And it's possible to read all different kinds of things into them. I feel like David and I gelled with different aspects of the text in different ways, and that made it especially productive because between us, we could pick each other up and say, actually, you know, I think this is not what's going on here, or I think we're bringing our own, we can identify each other's own preconceptions of what we brought to the text. And that helped us really kind of stay true to, to how open-ended they are. Um, so I think it was really helpful in that respect. Thank you. There's another question for, for the translators from Danny Gwynnon, who was one of the translators in the, in the pro project. Um, following on from what we were talking to Thomas and Karen about, uh, I suppose that the difference isn't kind of launching into a short story or launching into a novel. Um, the question is about whether that is different for a translator setting off to translate a shorter piece or a longer piece, if there are thing, different things you pay attention to. Alice, what about you? Do, do you? Does it feel like regardless of what kind of piece it is, the skill is basically the same? Or the, the process is basically the same. Yeah, I haven't actually translated a full length um, novel yet. So um, my experience has been mainly with ex extracts or like short stories. Um, so I can't really compare how it how my process works to a novel. Um, but you find different, different kinds of things and different kinds of writer, um, including a children's story and various different kinds of things. And I, I wonder whether essentially it's, it's, it's sort of the same job regardless of what, what the input is. I think, yeah, I think it's probably the same kind of process and you just adapt it depending on, depending on what exactly you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Joseph, what about you, having done, uh, having done novel length and shorter pieces as well? I think there's uh, an extent to which in a short, a short story, you're really paying much more attention to every word, um, which, I mean, obviously when you translate a book, you, 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 a full length book, you do that, but not every oh. section of it carries as much weight in the overall narrative, sometimes it's just the vehicle to get from A to B. Whereas in the short story, because there's this intense focus, it feels like everything there is there for a reason and you have to really suss it out. <clears throat> but also, I mean, the fact that it's a shorter length means that it's, it's more feasible to go back and reread and reread and reread and uh, really nail every sentence. Um, so in terms of how the, the work actually you know, how I actually tackle the work, the, the, the workflow felt slightly different to me in this case. Thank you. 
Um, there's a, I have a factual question for the two writers, a very straightforward one. Are Thomas's and Karen's books going to be translated into French? The person who's asking is a French native and also a translator. So very, very straightforward question. Karen, will you be in French at some point? I hope so. <laughs> but there are no plans at the moment. Well, we have, a, we have an eager translator watching. That's a good start. Thomas, oh. what about you? For me, exactly the same. Uh, no uh, plans, but uh, the same hope. Great. I'm going to ask one last question before we wrap up. Um, from This is actually from BCLT. Uh, no, I'm sorry, this is not from BCLT. These things are moving. This chat thing is moving slightly faster than I keep up. Um, a second, this is from uh, JC, and the question is um, how you feel about writers who write fiction directly into another language instead of their own native language, their own first language. And I wonder if you can say something about that choice um, to write in one language or another. Karen, from, from your point of view, say something about the, uh, making a decision to, to write in Dutch. Well, to be honest, um, so Dutch is my first language, yeah. so that's naturally the language that I write in. Um, I, I, I do write in English occasionally, but um, that story tends to unfold in a different direction when I, when I start writing in English. So I have it in my mind um, in Dutch, obviously, but then when I start writing in English, the language just takes me into another direction. So it's very interesting to see, but I think it also has to do with the fact that I don't know all the details, obviously, and all the, the nuances of, of the English language. So um, I try to, um, but it's different. I cannot translate myself. I cannot translate 100% uh, uh, from, from Dutch to English myself. So then I'd rather start in English just right from the start, start in English and then see what happens. And is there some temptation? I mean, because obviously both you and Thomas have, have excellent English. Um, I, I wonder what that temptation is even to try to move between the languages, to try writing something in English. There is a kind of, you know, corporate pressure as well as the other thing. Um, what, what is the thing that makes you want to want to try that other thing, that other language? Uh, well, to be honest, for me, it was just because I, I did a, um, I, I received a fellowship in Oxford last year. So I, um, I taught a few, I, I gave a few uh, classes in Oxford for, for the term. And um, sometimes I wanted to read to my students uh, parts of my work that weren't translated yet. So I did have a lot of a few translations, but some of them weren't translated. And um, so I had to do it myself. And then I came up with completely different stories. But, you know, <laughs> just go with the flow then. Oh, that's exciting and, and risky, interestingly risky. Thomas, what about you? Do you have a, do you have a temptation to to try writing in English or to try something else? Or, or does that feel dangerous? Well, the temptation of the idea because of the international audience and the, uh, well, all the thoughts of that you could uh, be, be read in, in, in England and uh, in America and wherever. But um, I, I think in Dutch, I, I formulate in Dutch, I write in Dutch, obviously. And even though I, I can read uh, in English most of the time, um, my my understanding of the language is isn't ju just isn't detailed and uh, good enough to really write in it. And one of my favorite authors ever, actually, uh, Nabokov, he uh, started writing in in English. I think halfway through his career, or at least when he was uh, some books uh, from the start, so not when he was young. And if I read his books in English, then I'm always I'm already impressed with him, but then I'm overwhelmed uh, because he made the switch from Russian to English and the quality of his work didn't even, uh, well, did improve, I think. And that's something that I really like, uh, well, I can only, uh, I can only uh, admire. And I know that that's something I will never be able to do. And, and that's also because even in, in Dutch, um, there's still a lot for me to, uh, well, not maybe not improve, but a lot to win. So it would be, uh, I don't think it would be a good idea to, to think uh, I can write in English. I, feel, I think that's exactly why there are translators, to feel all the details, all the nuances. Uh, and that's something I can only do in Dutch. So yeah, the idea is, uh, 
is inspiring and uh, I can dream about it, but I will never try it because I can't. I'm not going to ask the translators how they feel about all of their writers starting to write in English because we don't, as a profession, we don't on the whole, like vocationally, we don't approve of this because we all have to have to make a living. Um, let's just a quick last question for Alice just before we end. A uh, question's just come in from Paul Kay about Alice's story about Berghia. Um, and Paul says the Netherlands uh, has no high mountains and very little wilderness. So how much do these kinds of landscape feature in, in Dutch literature? It seems like an odd thing if you know the Netherlands, it seems like an odd subject. Yeah, I think a, a lot of Dutch literature tends to be more set kind of in the Netherlands in there's a lot of kind of farms or countryside type settings. Um, so yeah, this is something slightly different, I suppose, recalling a, a, a trip that she's made to, to Italy, to the Dolomites. So yeah, perhaps it's slightly different for Dutch literature. There is some, some somewhere further up the chat, there are comments about the lack of mountains in, in the Netherlands and indeed in Norfolk. Yeah. It's not, not very far up the chat. Um, we're going to have to come to an end uh, there. Thank you to those of you who uh, asked questions. I hope we got through uh, all of them or most of them. Um, we're going to thank, of course, um, New Dutch Writing, who uh, have organised this event with the National Centre for Writing, um, who are hosting it. Thank you to Martin, of course, who's done all of our tech and made it possible for you to see and hear us. Um, thank you to the Strangers Press, who've produced these beautiful things, which you can now order uh, from the Strangers Press website and I'm sure many other places. Um, and thank you, finally, of course, to our four speakers, Karen Amagmogkrim, Thomas Hemmer van Vos, Josef van der Wood, and Alice Tetley paul for a fascinating conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.